Hi, everyone. It's Ed Chang. Today's podcast features guest host and Excited Utterance associate producer Alex Nunn, whom you know from our special series last summer. Alex welcomes Mike Pardo, one of our very first guests, back to Excited Utterance. But before I hand things over to Alex, let me make a quick plug for the recently announced 2019 Evidence Summer Workshop which will be held at Vanderbilt Law School at the end of May. It's a summer works-in-progress conference, and it's the brainchild of Alex and myself, along with Excited Utterance alums Julia Simon Kerr and Maggie Whitland. Paper proposals are due March 15th, and further details can be found on the Excited Utterance webpage or evidenceworkshop.com. Excited Utterance the Evidence and Proof Podcast, episode number 65, Michael Pardo, The Paradoxes of Legal Proof. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your guest host, Alex Nunn, from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence we bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. Returning to the podcast is Michael Pardo. Michael is the Henry Upson Sims Professor of Law at the Hugh F. Culverhouse Jr. School of Law at the University of Alabama. Our podcast today features Michael's new paper, The Paradoxes of Legal Proof, A Critical Guide. As the title implies... Michael's piece examines the proof paradoxes, or hypotheticals that tend to strain our general understanding of the standards of proof. In particular, his paper explores three different types or three different categories of paradoxes, the statistical paradox, the conjunction paradox, and the verdict paradox. As you'll hear in my discussion with Michael, however, The focus of his paper is not so much in solving these paradoxes as insular problems. Rather, Michael seeks to cut to the deeper issues of legal proof that give rise to the paradoxes in the first place. That is, he seeks to explore what the paradoxes tell us about the nature of probative value and about the nature of proof. By refocusing the debate surrounding the paradoxes on these terms, Michael's paper invites us to use the paradoxes to unearth perhaps dormant issues and dormant assumptions surrounding the proof process. My conversation with Michael today begins with an exploration of the features of proof before we focus in particular on the proof paradoxes and the lessons to be gleaned therefrom. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's really great to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. So as I noted in my opening remarks, your paper focuses on these so-called proof paradoxes or hypotheticals that highlight some tension or maybe even expose some inconsistency in our current understanding of the process of legal proof. I look forward to having you on the show today to unpack your thoughts on those paradoxes in full but I'd actually like to begin where your paper does. And that's by exploring the features of the proof process that kind of give rise to these paradoxes in the first place. So Michael, let's start there. What do you see as the key aspects of the law that generate the paradoxes? Okay, so what generates the paradoxes seem to be certain assumptions about basic features of the legal proof process. Most importantly, standards of proof and what they require and the nature of probative value. And these assumptions seem to imply conclusions that are inconsistent with either intuitions about case outcomes or more abstractly with views about certain policy goals of the proof process regarding accuracy and the risk of error. And like other kinds of paradoxes generally, what seems to be going on is some tension between Either accepted premises or accepted premises seem to appear to lead to unacceptable conclusions. Great. And you note now that there have emerged kind of two primary theoretical counts aimed at 
explaining or even conceptualizing these features of the proof process. What are those two accounts? So I think they're probably best characterized as families or types of accounts. The first is more explicitly probabilistic theories that attempt to quantify probative value in some sense and also conceive of standards of proof as probabilistic thresholds of some sort. Perhaps most notably that the preponderance of the evidence standard means something like proof beyond 0.5 or greater than 50%. The alternative account is an explanatory account, one example of which has been developed by Ron Allen and myself looking at the relative plausibility of explanations. And under this account, standards of proof are conceptualized as explanatory thresholds. Essentially, fact finders compare the relative plausibility of competing explanations, and fact finders use some kind of plausibilistic reasoning to assess the likelihood or the probability of claims. So now that we've kind of unpacked the key features of legal proof, and you just mentioned those two theoretical accounts or family of accounts, um, that you mentioned that model those features. I want to turn to the primary topic of your paper at hand, which is, of course, the proof paradoxes. Now, in your current paper, you identify three general types or three general categories of paradoxes. I want to work through each of those categories in turn. So the first class of paradoxes involves statistical evidence. And within this broad category lies the famous blue bus problem. I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with the blue bus problem. But if you would, Michael, remind us of how that hypothetical runs. Okay, so under one version of the blue bus problem, the plaintiff is negligently hit by a bus but can't identify the color or the type of bus. The plaintiff, though, has statistical evidence that the blue bus company, the defendant, in the case owns, say, 70% of the buses in the town. All that matters is that the number is greater than 50%, which is assumed to be the standard of proof. And that's the only evidence presented on the issue. And the hypothetical raises two different but related questions. The first is whether that evidence is sufficient to get to trial in the first place. And second, and more strongly, is a judgment as a matter of law required for the plaintiff. So what creates the tension here is that um, the evidence appears to surpass the standard of proof, which implies that the answer to both of those questions is yes. However, the answer given by legal commentators, recently by philosophers, and most subjects in experimental studies is that the answer to both those questions is no, there shouldn't be liability. So you just touched on this a, a little bit, but uh, I, I want to ask to be clear, have commentators generally responded to the blue bus problem in a consistent way? That is, you know, has there been any general consensus that's emerged surrounding blue bus? It's been around for a few decades now, so I'm sure that there have been a number of responses to the problem. It's been around for decades. There have been numerous responses. There is uh, generally no consensus. Um, so the responses seem to fall into a couple of different categories. Uh, so one popular strategy is to concede liability from the two premises I mentioned. To say the probative value of the evidence, which is expressed by the statistic, seems to surpass the standard of proof. But to then argue that there are other policy goals, either epistemic issues or moral issues or economic issues that sort of override that conclusion. And so the, the point is, yes, liability seems to follow, but there are countervailing reasons why there shouldn't be liability in the case. And I think, and as I argue in the paper, these responses, I think, raise interesting issues for the law. But I put this strategy of response to the side because it seems to assume, rather than answer, what I think the key evidentiary issues raised by the paradoxes are, namely, what is the nature of probative value and what do standards of proof mean and require? So that's one strategy. Another strategy is to switch the conception of probability at issue. In other words, rather than relying on an objective probabilistic conception that says the evidence surpasses the standard of proof, the move is to say, well, let's adopt a subjective conception of probability. And under that conception, a jury might conclude that the probability that it was a blue bus under a degrees of belief kind of conception is less than 0.5. Now, this answers one of the two questions, namely, it, it gives you a reason why 
judgment as a matter of law for the plaintiff maybe shouldn't be required, but it also seems to concede that it would be perfectly okay for the jury to find liability based on this evidence. And some people find that to be just as unacceptable. More importantly, that purely subjective conception, probative value, does a poor job of accounting for probative value more generally. Most importantly, I think, in terms of the responses to the blue bus problem, most of the responses don't say anything about the standard of proof. It's just simply assumed as a key premise that the standard of proof is something like 0.5, and that seems to generate a lot of the paradoxical consequences. That's just an assumed premise rather than something that's argued about. And Michael, I want to follow up on that last item that you noted and and get your thoughts on what you think the blue bus problem and really the statistical paradoxes more generally tell us about the nature of probative value and, of course, the standards of proof. So I think the statistical evidence paradoxes raise really deep and really interesting questions about probative value and about standards of proof, but they don't really tell us anything about them. I think that's part of the reason why there's been little consensus about what to do with these problems. Related to this issue, I think some commentators think that that what the paradoxes do is reveal something about the deficiency of statistical evidence, that it somehow has lower probative value. And, And I think this is a mistaken assumption, that the law's pattern regarding statistical evidence is much more complicated. Statistical evidence is sometimes sufficient, sometimes not. Likewise, with non-statistical evidence, it's sometimes sufficient, sometimes not. So wherever the line is, and I'm skeptical that there is an abstract line, it's not between statistical and non-statistical evidence. So I think some of the confusion regarding these issues is that the, the examples mistakenly draw attention to the form of the evidence when the deeper issues about probative value and standards of proof aren't really addressed. Let's shift gears now to a second type or a second category of paradox. The conjunction paradox highlights this oddity that occurs with seemingly independent elements of an offense. Even if it's more likely than not that each element of an offense is satisfied, if we're looking at that element alone, kind of in a vacuum, the likelihood that all elements of an offense are satisfied in conjunction or simultaneously often falls below a 50% threshold. And as our listeners likely know, this is generally referred to as the conjunction paradox. How have some commentators addressed this second type of paradox and really the assumptions underlying it? Okay, so you're right. There's something odd going on with how the law applies standards of proof, primarily the fact that it instructs decision makers and courts decide issues going element by element. So for example, if a claim involves two elements, both are proven to 0.6, the plaintiff wins, but if those two issues are probabilistically independent, their conjunction is only 0.36 likely. And if this is true, and this is what's happening, this, this could lead to devastating consequences in terms of accuracy and errors. And so the law seems to be doing something that's at odd with basic probabilistic reasoning. But at the same time, very few commentators actually think that this issue is causing any sort of problem in actual cases. And so trying to explain what's going on here is part of, part of the problem. And legal scholars have taken essentially four different types of responses in trying to address this problem. And I'll just briefly go through each of these four possibilities. So first, some scholars have just denied that this is what the law is doing. So they've looked at, for example, pattern jury instructions that say, parties with the burden of proof have to prove each and every element. And scholars have argued, well, that specifies necessary but not sufficient conditions, that what should be happening or what does happen in these cases is jurors make a finding with regard to each element and also make a finding with regard to the conjunction to satisfy a claim. Plaintiffs have to satisfy the elements plus the conjunction. Now, this is, a, I think, a relatively clever reading of some of the instructions, but This interpretation is inconsistent with wide swaths of legal doctrine, not just pattern jury instructions, but also how judges actually instruct in actual cases, how courts assess sufficiency of the evidence, special verdicts, and a host of other issues. So there does seem to be substantial evidence that the law is doing what appears to be this odd practice. The second strategy, then, is to take a more normative response and say, well, if the law is doing this weird thing, the law should stop. We should change the way we instruct decision makers to alert them to the conjunction issue, make them 
make findings not only on individual elements, but also some finding about the conjunction as a whole. I think this strategy, although interesting, raises a host of problems as well. As I mentioned before, there doesn't seem to be much of a problem happening on the ground, and this strategy would introduce a pretty radical change into legal practice. So my sense is that the burden should be on anyone advocating this approach to first uh, illustrate why the change is necessary. Also, as other scholars have pointed out, requiring proof of the conjunction raises its own potentially paradoxical consequences. It also raises practical problems. We would have to know and instruct jurors about how to find dependence relationships between elements and other sorts of issues. So that's the, the normative strategy. A third possibility is to adopt alternative probabilistic accounts in some way. So one recent example of this offered by Kevin Claremont in various articles is to reject the application of the so-called product rule. In other words, to argue that the probability of two independent elements is not their conjunction, it's the probability of the least likely element. So under this interpretation, assuming two issues A and B are each proven to 0 0.6, under the least likely element rule, their conjunction is not 0.36, their conjunction is 0.6. This, I think, doesn't solve the conjunction problem. It's a bit like saying the probability of getting heads on two coin flips is 0 0.05, that, that rather than 0 0.025. That the conjunction effect that seems to trouble commentators, in other words, is a feature of the world. And I think there's an easy way to illustrate this, that if, if our two elements are, say, causation and identity, their combination is 0.6 only if one of those two issues entails the other. In other words, there's two other possibilities we have to consider, that there's causation and not identity, or there's identity and not causation. If, if the probability of either of those two possibilities is greater than zero, then you potentially have conjunction problems. So those are three possibilities. The fourth possibility is to adopt an explanatory account of standards of proof. And so under this account, the plaintiff will offer an explanation that, say, includes the elements. Let's just assume it's A and B again. The defendant will offer an alternative explanation that doesn't contain A or doesn't contain B or doesn't contain both of the elements. And fact finders will then assess these explanations as a whole the adopted explanation will then be compared with the elements at issue in the case. Under this conception or this account of the proof process, there are two features that help to reduce some of the more troubling conjunction aspects that commentators have discussed. On one hand, fact finders are assessing the case as a whole and then comparing that with the elements. So you get the case as a whole comparison that seems to match some of the legal policy goals. And on the other hand, the conjunction effect, if it's occurring, is getting distributed between both parties' explanations. Both parties are offering multi-part or multi-premise explanations that could have their own conjunction effect that can reduce some of the troubling consequences. So those are sort of four different ways scholars have responded to this particular kind of paradox. So in addition to elucidating those kind of fascinating responses to the conjunction paradox, what has the lasting significance of the hypothetical been? Kind of reviving the same question that I asked of statistical paradoxes, what does the conjunction paradox perhaps tell us about our current conceptualization of legal proof? So I think the significance of the conjunction paradox is that it really does raise fundamental questions about standards of proof, what they mean, what they require, are they probabilistic thresholds? Are they explanatory thresholds or not? This has not only practical effects for litigation cases, but it also tells us about the different kinds of paradoxes. So if we circle back now, for example, to the blue bus problem, if we conclude that based on our considerations of the conjunction issue or other issues that the standard of proof is not a probabilistic threshold like 0 0.5, we've now knocked out or at least called into question one of the key premises that was generating the paradox in the first place. If, for example, the standard of proof is an explanatory threshold, then it's not entirely clear what to do in the hypothetical cases like the blue bus problem. Those may just be unrealistic and underdetermined hypotheticals without clear answers. 
rather than paradoxes? And that may not be a very satisfying answer, but it helps to potentially diagnose why problems like the blue bus continue to fascinate, frustrate scholars, and why there's yet to be a clear consensus about those cases. So the third class of paradox that you identify in your paper is the verdict paradox. And rather than focusing primarily on a particular type of evidence, like statistical evidence, or the elements of an offense, like we saw was the focus of the conjunction paradox, verdict paradoxes really focus on a decision maker, uh, namely the jury. Of course, some of our listeners might remember this paradox from your last time on our show. But if you would, Michael, just remind us of the contours of verdict paradoxes. What exactly do they entail? In the paper, I focus on a group decision-making problem that can arise in which a group's answers on related issues may produce inconsistent answers depending on, whether, depending on how you aggregate them, whether you go as a whole, focusing on the conclusion, or whether you go issue by issue. And this is a problem that's not unique to juries. Juries are just one example. You can have similar problems with multi-member appellate courts or with any group decision-making body deciding interconnected issues. What produces the possibility for this problem with jury decision-making is two features of the proof process. One, that some verdicts in some jurisdictions may have a non-unanimous voting rule. And secondly, jurors may be asked to give answers on individual elements of claims. When you have those features, you may end up with an overall verdict that every single juror or a majority of the jurors actually rejects. And because of this same feature, you get some of the same effects that we were just discussing with the conjunction problem, only now they're getting spread out among jury members. And like the conjunction problem we just discussed, what seems to be generating a lot of the difficulty is conceiving of standards of proof as probabilistic thresholds like 0.5. So in the paper, I go through a kind of detailed example to try to illustrate how this can happen. I'll try to just briefly explain that example. Suppose you have a decision rule that requires nine out of 12 jurors to agree. And suppose, again, we have two issues, A and B, and six of our jurors think that each of those issues is proven to 0.6, and the other six do not. So just focusing on our six who think the two issues are proven to 0.6, we again have something like the conjunction issue. If these issues are probabilistically independent, their conjunction is only 0.36 likely. But let's focus on the six who don't think those two issues are proven. And suppose three of those jurors think A is proven to 0.6, but B is not. It's less than 0.5. And the other th three think B is proven to 0.6, but A is not. What do we do in that situation? Well, if we're thinking about this as a case as a whole, six jurors think the plaintiff has proven the case. Six jurors think that the plaintiff has not. We don't yet have a verdict Our nine out of 12. Under another line of reasoning, which generates some of the conjunction problem effects, however, the plaintiff wins. Why? Because nine jurors think A is proven, nine jurors think B is proven. And so you have, again, something that looks like the conjunction problem. Why? Because you know six jurors think it's proven, but it may only be 0.36 likely. And you know the other six think it's even a lower probability than that, because they think one of the two elements is less than 0.5 likely. If by contrast, you think about this from an explanatory perspective, you eliminate some of those paradoxical consequences. What you have instead is a situation where six jurors accept the plaintiff's explanation that includes A and B, six do not, and so the result is you don't yet have a verdict. You haven't had a situation arise yet in which nine out of the 12 have coalesced around a particular explanation. Pulling all of these threads together now, Michael, uh, I want to kind of explore the deeper lessons that the paradoxes offer. You suggest in your paper that the paradoxes really provide two key insights. One's general and another is specific. What are those insights? Okay, good. So the general insight we've alluded to a bit in our discussion, and that's the interrelated nature of the proof of paradoxes, that often these problems are treated as separate problems to be analyzed and tried to solve, but in fact, they relate to each other, that answers given on certain kinds of problems carry implications for other kinds of problems. So one example of this is the conjunction paradox and the verdict paradox both raise deep questions about standards of proof, what they mean, what they require. 
And how one answers that question or tries to resolve those issues will then carry over with implications for, say, the blue bus problem or the other statistical evidence cases. So that's the general insight, that these paradoxes raise fundamental questions about basic features of evidence and proof, and that they can't be cleanly separated, that answers to certain kinds of problems will carry over or have implications for other kinds of issues. The specific insight focuses specifically on standards of proof. For each type of paradox that we've talked about, the probabilistic conception that thinks of, say, the preponderance standard is 0.5 was the key premise that seemed to be generating most of the paradoxical consequences. This, in the paper, I refer to as the odd man out. If we give up this assumption, we eliminate or at least reduce many of the paradoxical consequences in each of the family of problems that we were discussing. So I want to follow up with a question on your specific insight. Um, having argued in the paper that the probabilistic model of the proof process is something of an inferior model, at least relative to the explanatory model, I wonder if you nonetheless have any thoughts on the probabilistic model's kind of sticky persistence. Is perceiving of, say, the preponderance standard as a 0.5 threshold test simply an easy analytical shortcut that we all gravitate towards? Or, and here I'm going to borrow from Lon Fuller's conception of legal fictions, could it be said that a probabilistic conception of proof is something of an admittedly perhaps false proposition that is nonetheless preserved and even endorsed due to a recognition of its significant utility as a modeling tool? So I think the, the prominence of the probability model is easy to explain in that it's a, it's a powerful and sometimes illuminating way of expressing the policy goals underlying the proof process regarding accuracy and the risk of error. It's not surprising that scholars interested in these issues would be drawn to this way of thinking. But I think the literature over the past few decades has revealed various ways in which that explanation breaks down. It breaks down analytically. Some of the paradoxes reveal this. It breaks down empirically. If we look at not only how legal actors behave, but also how legal proof works, how a lot of legal doctrine structures the process, and it breaks down normatively to some extent, at least if we think ought implies can, what would be required to implement such a system in light of the goals may be impossible in, in many kinds of cases. The explanatory account, by contrast, provides a realistic explanation of how the legal system in all of its complexity can implement its policy goals through some sort of explanatory reasoning by comparing alternatives and part of that explanation also includes an account of why the most troubling aspects of the paradoxes are perhaps not so troubling. Final question, Michael. What's next for the literature here? What type of paper do you think would shed additional insight on this issue? So I think there's more work to be done generally on probative value, on standards of proof, and on the nature of proof, nature of legal proof more generally. I think the paradoxes help to reveal these issues and reveal questions, but don't necessarily resolve them. So I think rather than having more solutions, for example, to the blue bus problem, there should be more general work trying to address these questions. And the significance would not just be in answering the strange hypotheticals, like in the, in the paradoxical cases, but for all litigated cases that depend to some extent on these issues. Well, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks. It's been fun. To my mind, Michael's paper offers us a wonderful opportunity to reevaluate our posture towards the proof paradoxes. As he mentioned on the show, there's often a temptation to perceive of the paradoxes as insular problems, tricky puzzles that arise in a vacuum and simply offer an engaging mental exercise. But as Michael's paper emphasizes, the paradoxes are much more than simple hypotheticals. They are demonstrative of an incomplete conceptualization of legal proof. Essentially, they are a symptom of a greater ill. As Michael puts it, the paradoxes, quote, unearth fundamental issues concerning the legal doctrine, practices, and concepts that structure the process of legal proof. And these issues have important implications, not merely for the examples themselves, but rather for every legal trial and for manifold issues throughout the processes of civil and criminal litigation. So Michael's challenge for us all moving forward 
is not so much to find a clever means of solving a paradox in a patchwork fashion. The challenge, at a much deeper level, is to construct an account of legal proof that takes the sting out of the proof paradoxes altogether. And as you survey the literature, you can see that scholars have started to move in this direction. Michael and Ronald Allen, for example, have constructed their conception of proof founded in relative plausibility. Ed Chang, of course our usual host on the podcast, reworked probabilistic accounts of proof by conceiving of legal standards as ratio tests rather than as absolute thresholds. Kevin Claremont has reinvented proof by importing principles of fuzzy logic. As Michael's paper rightly identifies, perhaps the paradox's ultimate utility is in encouraging us to directly confront the deeper issues of legal proof. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. Excited Utterance is produced by Ed Chang, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Megan Cole, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir, under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your guest host, Alex Nunn, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof.